Good morning, members of the press. My name is Lachwayo Gladys. I'm the Secretary for International Relations for the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, led by Advocate Nelson Chamisa. Um, today I'm going to be chairing this press conference. Uh, with me here I have um, our Deputy Secretary General, um, Anthony Chimini, David Anthony Chimini. Uh, we also have our Deputy President, Honorable Tendai uh, Biti, who is going to be up, uh, addressing this particular press conference. Our press conference today is going to be on the just-ended official visit of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Negative Impact of Unilateral Coercive Measures on the Enjoyment of Human Rights. So what we are going to do, our Vice President is going to address you, then after that we can take questions. Over to you, Vice President. Thank you very much. I beg indulgence in removing some of your toys. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are very indebted as usual that uh, you have blessed us uh, with your presence here uh, to deal with the, our response, official response, to the report by the special uh, UN Special Rapporteur uh, on the negative impact of coercive uh, measures. Uh, Miss uh, Alena uh, Doan, uh, who has been in Zimbabwe between the 17th of October uh, and the 27th uh, of October, and who presented a final report uh, yesterday. We have uh, procedural issues and procedural concerns we have we have substantive concerns uh, that we have, and I will raise uh, the same. So on procedural issues, I want to place it on record that uh, as, a, as, a, as a party, we have written a formal letter of complaint to, the, to New York, to the UN, about the conduct of uh, 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 Ms. Doan, uh, omissions and uh, commissions and uh, we hope that uh, the UN uh, will formally carry out an investigation to validate our complaints uh, and we hope that they will acknowledge uh, our uh, complaints. We believe that we are an important uh, stakeholder in this uh, a, a, a country we are the biggest political party in this uh, country. Our president polled over 2.6 million uh, votes in 2018. And therefore, uh, we have a legitimate uh, local standard, a legitimate uh, footing uh, in raising a complaint on behalf of the people of Zimbabwe uh, that we represent uh, both at home and uh, abroad. The first complaint uh, we have related to the bias in the consultations uh, by the UN Special uh, Rapporteur. If you look at a program which is a, a public, it was dominated uh, by public uh, authorities. So it is as if she came with a mindset of doing a one-sided subjective consultation uh, with the government and with government uh, officials. The reference to consultations with political parties, the reference with consultation to us in particular, in our respective view, was just uh, lipstick, uh, cursory, and indifferent. And I want to make reference in particular to our own consultation. 
we saw here uh, on the on 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 Wednesday, the twenty seventh of October, twenty twenty one, at three p.m. Our meeting lasted for two hours, from three p.m. to five p.m. So we find it absolutely amusing, if not ridiculous that we were the last group of persons uh, that uh, she saw. We found it ridiculous and amusing that we were nothing but a footnote uh, in a process of uh, consultation and engagement. What also has, um, has, uh, you know, amused us further is that immediately after we had left uh, that meeting, which was held at, the, at Block 10, uh, the UN uh, head office in Mount Pleasant. Uh, we collided with the publication of the interim uh, statement that was released on Wednesday, the 27th of October 2021. Yet in our meeting with her, she had actually asked for more documents uh, from us. And she had given us assurances that whatever representations which we were making would be taken uh, uh, on board in the presentation of a press statement the following day, namely the 28th uh, of uh, uh, October 2021. So in our view, a statement was pre-paid, pre-paid and pre-manufactured. And I actually believe that she actually wrote that statement before she came here. And when you look at a 12-page report presented yesterday, you actually will be shocked and disappointed that in the main, it represents a cut and paste job from the previous reports in Venezuela, Mr. Maduro's Venezuela, and in, 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 in Syria. And in fact, there are passages where she just plucks from a Venezuelan uh, 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 report and indigenize, indigenize by replacing Zimbabwe uh, with uh, uh, Venezuela. Uh, that is completely shocking for the UN. That is uh, completely dishonest. That is completely unprofessional. And it is completely unacceptable. I also want to report on our intercourse uh, with you uh, in the afternoon of uh, February, sorry, of October 20. Uh, our interface uh, with you. Uh, I read the delegation that comprised of uh, our Secretary General, Mr. Charlton Wende, our Secretary for International Affairs, uh, Ms. Tlachuayo, uh, who is uh, on my left, and our Secretary for Social Affairs, uh, Ms. Morini Kademaunga. In the past, collectively, we have received a hundreds of diplomatic delegations uh, in Zimbabwe. We have met hundreds of missions uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, to mention a few, a few years ago, uh, we, we entertained uh, Miss Tubai Juka. We've entertained so many uh, people, including the UN Secretary General himself. We were so disappointed by the presence of a very toxic uh, adversarial uh, environment in that uh, meeting. Uh, normally, these meetings tend to be inquisitorial. The visiting delegates politely ask you questions. We want to hear you on this. We want to hear you on this. We want to hear you on this. We found a very defensive uh, Miss Elena, uh, you know, 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 Doan. Uh, we find a very obstructive Miss Elena, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Doan. And at some stage, it was like you were in a, you know, in a court of law, a very ugly, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, atmosphere. Particularly uh, when we pointed out uh, some iniquities, uh, some of which I'll point out, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, below. One of the one of the one of the debates we had with her uh, was her insistence that her mandate was a narrow one, and her mandate was just that of looking just at the negative impact of what she called uh, unilateral uh, sanctions. 
And we pointed out that you cannot delink, you cannot decouple the issue of Zimbabwe's isolation with the structural problems that Zimbabwe are facing. These structural pro problems include the issue of governance, the issue of legitimacy in stolen elections, the issue of the rule of law, the issue of corruption, uh, for, for Christ's sake. So that is, is the same equation. You cannot decouple and delink. So she spent a lot of time digging uh, her head in the sand like an ostrich, insisting that she had no mandate to look at those issues that there were other special rapporteurs for those areas. But in Russia, but it's, 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 it's uh, impossible. We also had arguments on definitions. So at the end of the day, we found a very acrimonious, a very belligerent uh, 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 rapporteur, inconsistent with the UN uh, that we know, inconsistent with the international uh, diplomacy. So we are disappointed, and as I've said, uh, we have uh, written uh, to the UN uh, to ask uh, about such conduct, conduct because in our view, your conduct is inconsistent with the implied or express conduct expected uh, of a senior diplomat uh, of a huge organization and an important organization uh, such, as the, uh, such as the UN. We are also concerned about a question she couldn't answer at a press briefing uh, yesterday, which is the critical question of who funded her trip to Zimbabwe. As all of you know, rapporteurs, special rapporteurs, are not employed uh, by the UN. So when they carry out their mandate, someone has to uh, fund in the interest of transparency and openness, we ask the Zimbabwean government to disclose whether in fact they actually uh, funded here. All of you are journalists and you know that we have a Freedom of Information Act that is anchored on section 62 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. And section 62 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe makes it very clear that the state is obliged to provide information that is in the public interest. It is in the public interest for Zimbabweans to know who funded Miss Alena Doan's uh, two-week joint uh, in Zimbabwe between the 7th, sorry, between the 17th of October uh, 2021 to the 28th uh, of October 2021. For all we know, she might be sampling our best tourist resort, Victoria Falls, right now at taxpayers' expense. We, the taxpayers of Zimbabwe, armed with our constitution, demand the right to know who funded this trip. One of the things that concerns us is that while it's the Zimbabwean government, and we don't know, may not necessarily have funded this trip, we know of the existence of cartels and other dubious and nebulous characters that are making huge rains in Zimbabwe, who may in fact have funded it. And I want to make reference to Trafigura. Trafigura, as you know, is a huge uh, Russian conglomerate that is based in Switzerland, uh, capitalized to the, with a market capitalization of US $98 billion. It controls our pipeline together with a, a local a, 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 a partner. The Zimbabwe fuel industry is a US $2 billion uh, industry. Did Trafigura or any other party actually fund uh, Ms. Doan Strip? Which is why in our letter to the UN, we've asked her to ask her this question and also to verify with her own personal accounts the source of her funding and the source of deposits and credits in your account uh, in the last uh, few weeks. So we are not making any allegation against anyone, against the air, against the traffic guru. We are simply asking for full disclosure of who funded the air because our constitution gives us the right to information which is protected and codified in section 62 of the constitution uh, of Zimbabwe. 
and you members of the media, you have got a right to information, the right to the media, codified and protected by Section 61 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. I now move to the merits, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to underscore one thing, and I'm glad our friends at the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation are here. The MDC Alliance, led by advocate Nelson Chamisa, stands for the end to the isolation of Zimbabwe. And this is not a new thing. It is stated clearly and unambiguously in our smart blueprint doctrine document that was published in June of 2018. So I want to restate again out of uh, the avoidance of doubt. In Latin we say ex abadante cautela. The MDC Alliance led by advocate Nelson Chamisa stands for the end to the isolation uh, of Zimbabwe and the total integration of Zimbabwe into the community of nations. But however, this discussion must be linked inextricably umbilical to the address of the Zimbabwean crisis in its totality. So it cannot be a delinked and decoupled debate. The question of Zimbabwe's isolation must be connected to discussions around the totality of the Zimbabwean crisis, focusing in particular on the following issues. Number one, the issue of governance, accountability, the issue of transparency, the issue of legitimacy, and the right of Zimbabweans to hold free and fair election. The issue of uh, violence and the security of uh, the person. Only last week our president was attacked in uh, Mashingo and his vehicle uh, was damaged. Only last week uh, there was an assassination attempt on our president uh, in Mutari, a few kilometers uh, from Mutari uh, in the Zimunya uh, 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 communal uh, uh, lands. These discussions uh, should be on the table. There must be discussions on the constitution, which in two years the government has mutilated through constitutional amendment number one and number two. There must be discussion on harmonizing uh, our country's laws to this uh, constitution. I made reference to the ZBC a few minutes ago. Is it not an atrocity that 41 years after independence, we still have in this country one broadcasting house, which I noticed continuously wins awards for the best broadcast of the year at our Zimbabwe International Trade Fair uh, annual. Is it that not an, a, a, you know, in, a, 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 ironic? The issue of corruption, freedom of the person, freedom of movement. So in this regard, as Professor Walshman Nube uh, stated two years ago in this two days ago in this very uh, garden we support the newfound attitude and expression by the sadc by sadic and the african union of making a connection between the ending zimbabwe's isolation and addressing the key fundamental challenges that are affecting uh, zimbabwe which are the issue of contested elections which is the issue of contested leadership, which is the issue of lack of leadership, vacuous leadership, ideologically bankrupt uh, 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 leadership, the issue of corruption and extractiveness, the issue of lack of accountability and impunity, the issue of uh, abuse of law and the absence of constitutionalism in this country. These issues are a total package and they cannot be uh, delinked. So, that is our position. Don't second guess us on this clear and unambiguous uh, uh, position. With that remark, I now want to go to our reservations with uh, Ms. Doan's uh, statement, uh, both the interim statement which she released Nicodemusly behind our back in the process of consulting with her on Wednesday, the 27th of October 2021 and the final 12-page statement uh, which released uh, yesterday afternoon, the 28th of October uh, 
2021. The first thing we uh, uh, find, we find the report full of uh, contradictions and full of uh, downright distortions and also full of uh, technical, technical uh, distortions. What we don't know is that whether she's just plain illiterate or she is just plain uh, dishonest. But given the impressive array of the academic qualifications, we would like to think that it's deliberate or boostification and deliberate uh, dishonest. And I'll try to demonstrate here uh, those uh, distortions uh, or boostifications and uh, mendacity in a, a report. So the first challenge we have is the definition of uh, measures. She's quick to define the measures that have been taken uh, against Zimbabwe as unilateral. Now, the first challenge with that is that that is simply not true. So I want to begin with the measures that were taken by the European Union in 2001. So what happened was that we had a general election on the 11th of March 2001, as all of you know. And it was contested between the late and great President Morgan Changirai and of course uh, President uh, Robert Mugabe who was lying uh, in a grave 147 kilometers from where I'm standing here in rural Zimbabwe. Before the eve of this election Zimbabwe expelled European Union observers that were led by Swedish international Pierre Scori. And Pierre Scori was a very senior diplomat in Brussels. He had been one of their commissioners. Those of you who know the infrastructure in Brussels, the infrastructure at the European uh, Union and the, at the European uh, Commission. Now, you don't expel observers. Co the community of nations who react to you. And this is one of the things about measures taken against Zimbabwe. They are on goals. They are authored and mothered by Zimbabwe's own omissions and commissions and by Zimbabwe's own refusal to play according to the standards of international law and the international uh, community. When Pierre Scori and his team were expelled, the European Union immediately started consultations in terms of the Cotonou Agreement. The Cotonou Agreement is the agreement between the European Union, between Brussels and members of the ACP. The ACP stands for African uh, 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 Caribbean Pacific countries. So they have a relationship with Brussels and that relationship is called the Cotonou Agreement which was a successor to the Lome Agreement. So Article 6 and Article 96 of the Cotonou Agreement says, if a member state fails to uphold certain standards in terms of that agreement, certain punitive measures will be taken. It is as a result of the Article 6 and Article 96 consultations in terms of the Cotonou Agreement that targeted sanctions were placed on some individuals in Zimbabwe. And that is not unilateral. That was not unilateral. And Ms. Doan can't define unilateral as any action taken outside the UN. Because that is wrong. When Sadiq meets and decides to take action against the military in Lesotho or the military in Madagascar, or when he decides to send peacekeepers in Swaziland, it, or Eswatin, it doesn't need the approval or consent of the UN or the UN Security Council. When the West African Union decides to send troops to look for Charles Taylor in Liberia or in Sierra Leone, it doesn't need approval from 
the uh, uh, United Nations. In other words, there are other multilateral organs of international law, the European Union being one of them, the African Union being one of them, SADC being one of them, which operates on the basis of consent of the member states to create norms and standards which if one of the member states breaches the other member states act. That's, that's basic elementary international law. How she can twist this eludes, eludes uh, our, our wisdom. The second complaint on substance is one thing that I've already alluded to, which is a decoupling of cause and effect, which is a delinking the agency of the Zimbabwean government, the responsibility of the Zimbabwean government over its actions which have resulted in the effects and in certain results which have been detrimental to the Zimbabwean people. So you can't, for instance, talk of economic malaise in Zimbabwe without talking of the pervasive impact of corruption in Zimbabwe. So when, when 2.7 billion US dollars is stolen in 2017 through treasure, it would be wrong to delink that with the suffering of our people. When 3.5 billion US dollars is lost directly through treasure in 2018, you can't delink that as she does in a report with the suffering of our people. When 6.9 billion dollars, according to the Audit General Report of 2019, is stolen from treasure, you can't delink that uh, from the suffering of our people. Uh, we, we, we have gold over 100 million dollars per month is being lost in illicit gold exports alone, which will be a billion dollars uh, by the end of the year. And you can deal with the issue of corruption, massive corruption uh, with the, uh, with the uh, Zimbabwean uh, crisis. So there is, a, there is cause and effect. And so we object to a report that pretends that the Zimbabwean government is clean, that the Zimbabwean government has no agency, that then decouples and delinks the Zimbabwean crisis from the active uh, uh, responsibility of the actors that are controlling uh, the Zimbabwean uh, 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 government. Thirdly, we have a problem in conflating targeted measures which exist and no one disputes them with the measures and the penalties imposed against Zimbabwean companies within different specific agreements. Since 9-11, the world is operating under a strict regime of international financial compliance. That strict international financial compliance is regulated by two key institutions. Number one is the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, based in uh, New York. The function of the Financial Action Task Force is to follow money, to follow global money, and to ensure that global money does not finance terrorism, global terrorism does not finance and is not a subject of money laundering, does not finance illicit financial flows, in particular child trafficking, in particular arms dealing, in particular uh, drugs. So OFAC follows, follows the money to see that there's not been breaches of its rules and regulations. And as a result of penalties taken and imposed by OFAC, you have seen big global banks such as Barclays Bank, such as HSBC, such as ABN AMRO, such as Standard Chartered Bank, uh, UK, being fined billions of dollars by 
OFAC. It has nothing to do with the political sanctions. It is because you have failed to be transparent or you have aided and abetted an identified designated person, either an arms dealer or a member of Al-Qaeda and so forth. So you, you can't do that. But the bank, the, the report conflates that. So she mentions three banks that have been fined in Zimbabwe. It has nothing to do with measures against the and targeted measures. It has everything to do with the compliance with uh, FATF. Then you have got OFAC. OFAC traces assets. OFAC traces assets across the globe. Because the tendency is that dictators and, uh, and uh, you know, you know, take Mobutu Seseko, take Sania Bacha, uh, take uh, 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 people like Ayadema. They, these dictators have There's a tendency of uh, buying property in different parts of the world. And one of the key things that OFAC does is to trace that property. So when you are, you are the president of a poor little country like Zimbabwe, you certainly have assets in Dubai, assets in Singapore, assets in Hong Kong, assets in Shanghai, OFAC will pick that up. And when measures are taken in terms of OFAC or FATF, it has nothing to do with political questions. But the report seems to conflate that. We find that dishonest. We find that uh, uh, unacceptable. Then we have figures that are thrown around in that report. And there are two figures she throws around without uh, substance. And we've, we've got great problems. So she, she says in her report that... Were it not for these measures, Zimbabwe would have received 100 billion US dollars in the form of overseas development assistance, in the form of grants, and so forth. But that is impossible. Where does this 100 billion dollars come from? Kenya has not received that 100 billion dollars. Malawi has not received that 100 billion dollars. Ghana has not received that hundred billion dollars. South Africa has not received that hundred billion dollars. And there are no measures against this country. So with the problem, the wild figures that are just thrown around. She also says that Zimbabwe's infrastructure deficit as a result of these measures is, is $34 billion. But, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, this economy has been terribly mismanaged. So terribly mismanaged that... Uh, we can't attend to the infrastructural deficit of our country as, as Zimbabweans. We've got a 100 kilometer stretch of road across the length of breadth of Zimbabwe. Under Ian Smith, 30% of that kilometer stretch of road was tarred. Under the present government, less than 10% is tarred. That has nothing to do with the Washington or Brussels or Rwanda. It is because we have not bothered to invest in infrastructure. As I'm talking to you right now, we have become the blackout capital of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. There's no electricity. Why? Because the machines and the generators we are using at Wange, one to six, should have been decommissioned in 1984. So we are using machines that belong to a museum, and you can't blame that uh, on, on measures. Then, another thing which uh, she is totally wrong and false. And I'm concluding now. It is our relationship with the international financial institutions. The World Bank, the African Development Bank, and the IMF. So she says because of sanctions, Zimbabwe has failed to access money from the World Bank money from the IMF, and money from the African Development Bank. But that is not true. The reason why we have failed to access resources from these institutions is because with arrears, Zimbabwe defaulted on its repayment obligations way back in 1999. Way back in 1999. So if you go and borrow from OK Bazaars, or from Foshini or Edgar's, and you default on your loan. You can't say it's sanctions when Edgar refuses to give you another suit or another dress. You have defaulted. 
Zimbabwe has got a serious debt over here. She puts the figure at 8 billion US dollars in her report. The correct figure is 12 billion dollars. Broken down as follows. 2 billion US dollars that we owe to the World Bank. 5.4 billion dollars that we owe to what are called the Paris Club of Lenders, which is basically European institutions and European uh, companies. $600 million that we owe to the African Development Bank. The remainder, a lot of money is owed, as you know, to the African Import and Export Bank. The remainder, as you know, a lot of money, and no one knows the figure, is also owned to the Republic of China. Some money is also owed to, small amounts are owed to governments such as uh, India and uh, other African states. So we have got, not only do we have debt, with arrears, and arrears arise when you fail to service your debt. And when you fail to service your debt and you accumulate arrears, the lenders will not lend you money. That is why it is so important for Zimbabwe to have a debt strategy. That is why during my time I had what we, I called, and what we called the Zimbabwe Accelerated Arrears Debt and Development Strategy, ESADS. That is why even Minister Chinamasa, in 2015, if you recall, had what he called the Lima process. The Lima process was an attempt to deal uh, with Zimbabwe's debt crisis. Unfortunately, Mr. Mtulingube has nothing. But at least Chinamasa had the decency of excavating what he called the Lima crisis. So when Zimbabwe fails to access loans from the African Development Bank, the IMF, the, 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 the World Bank, it is because of our arrears and resolving and i keep on saying this resolving our debt crisis is key because it is a development issue the original name of the world bank is the bank of reconstruction so if you want cheap money free grants very cheap money you access it through the world bank but you can't access it when you've got arrears you can't access it when you've got arrears and since 1999 zimbabwe has defaulted Finally, before I go to my conclusion, she also says Zimbabwe's risk is very high. So she says we are lending money above 7%. Zimbabwe's risk profile is high, of course. But why is it high? It is high because we don't respect agreements. There is no property rights in this country. So I don't even want to go to, 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 to the absence of title deeds given to farmers. Without title deeds, there's no, there, there's no respect to title. I want to go to the mismanagement of our foreign currents. Who will invest in a country where you bring in U.S. dollars, but one morning, the 19th of February, you wake up and be told that your money is now RTGS dollars, equal one for one, geje, geje, with a bond note. Which investor, if you are a financial advisor, you'll be fired. And that is what contributes to our high risk profile. We don't respect property rights. We don't respect agreements. As a lawyer, I've spent the past two years representing old depositors who put their money in the old mutual, in cabs. And one morning they woke up their money, they had saved pensions, and they were told it's now Zimbabwean dollars. In 2008, our pension years lost 5.68 billion US dollars worth of pensions. We invest money in an economy like this. After 2009, those same pension years worked in savings in US dollars only to wake up one morning on the 22nd of February 2019 through statutory instrument 33 of 2019 to be told that your money is now Zimbabwean dollars. That is why Zimbabwe's risk profile is so high. So again, we take, we take great exception to the lies, if you like, the misrepresentation, deliberate uh, uh, misrepresentation. In conclusion, I want to say, and, and by the way, by the way, she has to contrive this uh, submission because she has a problem with Zimbabwe's balance of payment position. Zimbabwe is trading with every country. Zimbabwe is trading with every country. Zimbabwe has got a healthy trade uh, position. And I'll just give you quick figures. Exports, Zimbabwe's exports, 2019, 4.6 billion. 2020, 
2020 4.9 billion 2021 5.1 billion zimbabwe's imports 2019 4.4 billion 2020 4.7 billion 2021 5.2 billion but this is the interesting figure this is our surplus now trade surplus 2019 1.3 billion 2020 1.7 billion 2021 1.7 billion so in other words we actually have a healthy trading account in economics it's called a current account our current account is actually very healthy meaning that we are trading with everyone so in the context of that it's very difficult to sell the myth and lie of measures affecting uh, zimbabwe it's, 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 it's a very uh, it's very uh, high and the figure i was referring to i actually extracted it from Minister Mtuling Ube's mid-term review statement provided in July uh, of 2021. In conclusion, I want to state that we need, as Zimbabweans, to be honest with ourselves and to accept that we need broad, genuine dialogue to resolve the Zimbabwean crisis. And if we resolve the Zimbabwean crisis amongst ourselves, we answer immediately whatever measures that are existing around our country. We need stability and we need oneness and the capacity to work together. In the brief period that we worked together in 2009 and 2013, we did so well. When those measures were in fact in existence, look at the figures of the government of national unit. Look at the growth figures. So they became irrelevant because we were together. So we call, as Professor Walshman did two days ago, we call for genuine dialogue guaranteed by SADIC, guaranteed by the international community. We call for reforms, constitutional reforms, electoral reforms, as we argued in our two documents, Reload and a Prize. We call for a sustainable Zimbabwe, led by a leader chosen and loved uh, by the people, whom, by the way, is advocate Nelson Chamisa. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Iti, um, for that address. I now open the floor for questions. Please do feel free yeah. to ask in any language that you want to use. If you want to use vernacular, that's, that's okay. I will take three questions um, at a time, and we'll answer them and take another round. Yes, and if you can also introduce yourself, your name and the media house where you're coming from. Uh, thank you. My name is Abu Chambab. Uh, you mentioned corruption. Uh, I think it's the, and one of the things that the Rapid Council did to the press conference was that corruption, uh, corruption is being driven because of the sanctions. Uh, she says that there's a link between the sanctions and the corruption. What you Thank you for that question. Uh -huh. I'll take um, If I can take your SAGC, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is actually a point of clarity. Um, you did say that um, the MDC alliance is for the ending of isolation. Then you also said you recognize SADA as the um, What is your position regarding the 25th? Then secondly, um, she did indicate that, uh, uh, Ms. Doan did indicate that the report is not final. So, are you saying you are not convinced that your voices in the final, final report that will be presented to the United Nations uh, next year, your, your, your input will not be captured? Uh, and why would you Thank you so much for those questions. Let me, answer, yeah. Yeah, let me yeah. answer these words. Yeah, so I'll begin with your final question. We, as I said, we've written a complaint to the UN. So we don't believe that she is a fair interlocutor. We don't believe that uh, she is an you know, impartial interlocutor. We believe she's biased. We believe she's prepaid. And uh, we believe she's uh, subjective. The way she treated us, for instance, uh, was just a shocking. It lacked decency, 
it lacked decorum, it lacked uh, respect. Uh, and so, and we have also looked at the previous uh, reports in Syria, in Venezuela, and in other cases. Uh, we cannot uh, but be persuaded that uh, she's just a spokesperson of, of rogue uh, regimes and the uh, rogue uh, elements. So we, we, we don't believe that uh, year reports, whether final or, or otherwise, will be an objective uh, representation uh, of the Zimbabwean crisis and what needs uh, uh, to, be, to, be, to, be, to be done. Uh, 25 October is ZANU PF Day. Uh, it has nothing to do with us. It's ZANU PF Day. Uh, uh, it, it, we have nothing to do with it. Uh, but as I said, we want full dialogue. We want full dialogue to focus on all these issues. And yes, yes, we've argued for the, for, the, for, the, for the issue of isolation to be addressed along the lines that I have uh, uh, dealt with uh, uh, before. We find it absurd. We find it absurd that uh, the cause of stealing can anything be external? I mean, we find it absurd. You go to the Minister of Health and you are granted an $80 million contract which is signed by the Minister of Health in his ugly handwriting. You steal $80 million. The Auditor General of Zimbabwe says $89 million US million of funds that way given for COVID were stolen. How does how does Brussels or London or Washington DC come into play? You're just a thief. <laughs> a big thief. So they suggested that you steal because there's London or Brussels is so grossly unreasonable such that no rational person properly applying your mind would have made such a statement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will take another round of questions if you still have questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Like we no longer <laughs> thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you so much for your patience and uh, for coming at such a short notice. Thank you. We come to the end of our press conference. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well articulated. Yeah, you will. Yeah. 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 No, you 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 have Actually, you are lecturing. Yeah, yeah. Madam, 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 Madam,